Happy Sabbath, everyone. Thank you for that song. Can't think of a better song to uh, approach our topic for today. Is it well with your soul today? Amen. So let's have a word of prayer. Let's ask for God's Spirit to be here with us so that He can be the one that is teaching us and leading us through today's lesson. Our dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for the gift of your Spirit that you've promised to be here with us in our midst that you would be the one speaking to our hearts. And so, Father, I pray, uh, especially uh, today, that your, uh, your presence would be here, that your angels would be guarding around us, that you would keep us from distractions, and that uh, you would be ministering to our hearts. We thank you uh, for this time that we have. We know our time is short here on this earth, and so I just pray that... Uh, uh, this message would, would speak to our hearts, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if someone were to ask, um, or if they were to say that uh, these aren't regular, normal sermons, I would find that to be a compliment, because if we truly believed the time in which we're living in, if we truly believed that we are on the edge of eternity, that the day and hour of Christ appearing uh, is closer now than when we first believed, amen, and that the events that we have long awaited for that are to precede that coming are to soon open upon us, uh, these messages shouldn't be normal, and we should be looking at what's to open upon this world and uh, overtake many of us as an overwhelming surprise. And in Maranatha, page 198, it says, Wonderful events are soon to open before the world. The end of all things is at hand. The time of trouble is about to come upon the people of God. Then it is that the decree will go forth, forbidding those who keep the Sabbath of the Lord to buy or sell, and threatening them with punishment and even death, if they do not observe the first day of the week as the Sabbath. So this really encompasses what the final issue is going to be on. The final issue that is going to bring God's people to a decision of receiving the mark of the beast or the seal of God is going to be over the issue of worship. It's going to be an issue of, have we been preparing for this moment? Because when it comes to the actual test that is to come upon God's people, it's not going to be about whether or not we have the right answer. You can know which day is the Sabbath. You can know that these events are going to come upon this world and still make the wrong decision. And so I want us to all read carefully this quotation here as we really think about this. It says, As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Just think about that for a moment when we think about the world that we're living in now, when we think about 2020, and we think of how close this world is to just unraveling in front of us and that the scenes that we can only imagine are just right around the corner. What are we doing now in preparation 
for these events? Are we uniting with the world now and partaking of its spirit so that when that time comes, we will view matters in the same light as the rest of the world? And we'll see more of what the spirit of the world entails as we get into this message. But if you remember what Pastor talked about last week, his message was return to the wilderness. And he showed the church, seen through the example of the Waldensian church, but he showed the church in the wilderness. It says there that the woman, which is a symbol of God's people, a symbol of the saints of the Most High, it says she was given wings, two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is what? Where she's nourished. For a time times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. This time period... This 1260 years, 1260 years of papal supremacy from 538 to 1798, we saw God's people plunged into scenes of persecution and strife and bloodshed that they would have never imagined. This happened because of what we saw from the very beginning. It was prophesied centuries before, there all the way back in Daniel chapter 2, this mixture of iron and clay, a mixture of church and state, this union seen through this papal power, this little horn power that was to speak blasphemies and to persecute the saints of the Most High for a time, times, and a half a time, 1260 years, 42 months. So go with me to Revelation chapter 12, and we see this woman, as she flees into the wilderness, what the devil tries to do while she is there in the wilderness. As she's there being nourished, she's being there prepared by God, And she is receiving what she needs to be able to withstand and endure the time of trouble that is before her. And in Revelation 12, verse 15, it says, The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman. The earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. We saw this just a few Sabbaths ago. The United States rising up out of this earth, out of an unpopulated area, not in the midst of war and strife and the winds that we saw of the earlier beast in Daniel chapter 7, but this earth where the United States was to grow up is the same place where this woman was able to seek refuge and escape civil and religious persecution. And it says here in verse 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and it went to make war with the remnants of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. We saw in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11 that this beast that had horns like a lamb and that it was to speak of a dragon, that this would be an image to the beast that would rise up here, another union of church and state. Though the beast that was to come up out of the sea and rule for the 1260 years, it received a mortal wound in 1798, but in Revelation 13 and verse 4, or Revelation 13 and verse 3, it says, I saw one of its heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. So the things that we learned of, that Pastor shared with us last Sabbath, and then we saw this several Sabbaths before, this was an unintentional uh, series that, uh, that, that we, we give credit to God for, for putting together in the way that he did, but that we saw through the example of the Waldensians what they were able to do and to accomplish in the midst of that persecution, what they were doing during this time of trouble in sharing God's world and keeping the light of God's truth alive when this was the darkest time in Earth's history up until that point. But that this deadly wound would be healed, this beast, this union of church and state, we would see that happen here in the country in which we are living in. That apostate Protestantism would go to the civil authorities of this nation to enforce morality, to enforce its dogmas and decrees. And how awesome of a, of a thought that is that we are living in the country that we can see written down in prophecy. 2,000 years before, and here we are in the dead center of it. What an awesome feeling and an awesome, uh, what that should make us feel. I mean, it's just a, a loss of words to know that the things that are about to take place is going to begin right here. Because of this union of church and state, because of this, God's people are going to be brought to the test. They're going to be tested and tried. And 
I could not think of a better way, as we've been building up to this and we've been talking about these things, I could not think of a better thing to help us than to just look at Jesus. If there was a verse that I would want you to take away from this message, it would be this one right here. It says, For even here and two were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us a what? An example. That you should follow his steps, who did not what? Who did no sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. If there was a verse that could summarize this message any better, and if you were to leave and take anything away with you about what I wanted to share with you today, it would be found right here in this verse. That the only way that we are going to be able to survive, not just with our earthly temporal lives, but any way that we are going to see our salvation on the other side of this, is if we focus on Jesus. It's the only way that God's people are going to be able to withstand and endure the trials and to be found as patient, enduring saints. And so we need to see what Jesus went through and see that everything that Christ went through is exactly what we are going to have to go through. When it says here that Christ left us an example, that's exactly what it means. Christ did not come all the way down here to just live a life that we could not live. Christ came down here to give us a perfect example of not just what God would do, but what a man in the power and strength of God can do. An example that we are to follow. And we saw part of this last Sabbath, speaking of that wilderness. It says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there he did what? He prayed. That word solitary is the same word for wilderness that we find here, Luke 5 and verse 16. He withdrew himself into the wilderness and he prayed. Pastor showed us last Sabbath, the wilderness for God's people has to be here in our mind. We have to be living in the wilderness right here where we are at. Location is nice, that's not the point. We have to be living in the wilderness right now. It says, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. We need to have a one-on-one personal relationship with our father. A secret relationship, a private relationship. It's not just one that we come to church to experience but one that we have on a day-to-day basis. Throughout the day, we should get to the point to where we don't want to let go. Because as soon as we let go and disconnect ourselves from that vine, what happens? We die. We will not be prepared for the trial that is soon to overtake God's people. It says, Then come Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit you here while I go and pray yonder. Jesus won his battle in Gethsemane. It wasn't after he had endured and after he was tried and after he gave up his life there on the cross. Jesus won the battle on his knees in Gethsemane because he had won the battle every single day there in the wilderness, there in prayer, in a private one-on-one relationship with his father that he was not willing to let go of. And when he even felt the separation between him and his father, he knew it. He knew what had happened. So this is where our focus should be as we go in to consider what what it is that we are going to have to go through. And so just as it was in Jesus' day, we're going to consider 
a verse in Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9. The thing that hath been is that which shall be. That which is done is that which shall be done. And there is how many new things under the sun? No new thing under the sun. No, I'm not going to sing it. There's a song that goes with it. But that's a verse that we should memorize. The thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. As we consider the life of Jesus, his life is a type and an example of what we will go through, but how it is that we can endure. And it begins right here in prayer, in a one-on-one relationship with our Father. So in the time of the days of Jesus, we also saw a joining of church and state. A pattern that we see repeated all throughout the Bible, we see once again there in Jesus' day, we saw it there. This, was, this is something the Bible just repeats over and over to make sure that you understand it and to make sure that you will see it and catch it when it happens. We saw it with Jezebel, a symbol of a woman, a harlot woman, using Ahab, a political power, a king, to persecute Elijah, a symbol of God's people. We saw the same thing. Herodias and her daughter, Salome, influencing Herod, the king, to persecute John the Baptist, a symbol, once again, of God's people. In Jesus' day, we saw the Jews, the church, God's people, going to the Roman power, to persecute Jesus. Matthew 27, verse 1 and 2, it says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. You see, the Jews couldn't do this themselves. They even said, this is not according to our law. We cannot put a man to death, but we can try to uh, convict him of a crime take him to the Roman authorities, and they can put him to death. And that's what they sought to do. Once again, a joining of church and state. We saw the same thing through the 1260 years. The papal power using the kings of Europe to enforce its dogmas and decrees and to put, some say, 50 million to 100 million of God's people to death for the crime of heresy. And when that deadly wound is healed, once again, you will see what we see in Revelation chapter 17, a woman riding the beast. Once again, we will see church and state uniting, and as we've seen it repeat over and over again, it will be to persecute God's people. See, when you have to force morality, it's because there is no power in the church. When the church has to force someone to believe a certain way and to do a certain thing, it's because the church has lost its power. There is no spirit in that church. And so the only thing that it has left is to force. And when we see institutions, even ideological groups now, in the, forming in the function of a church, essentially, enforcing morality, it's because they have no spirit. The spirit of God is not there. We see that it will also be a matter of national security. The United States seeking to keep the nation from falling, will try to uplift a, an answer to the problem and persecution of those who stand in the way of what they think is going to solve the world's problems. And we see this in John chapter 11. Go with me there. John chapter 11, reading from verse 47. It says, Then gathered the chief priests, the Pharisees, a council, and said, What do we for this man doeth many miracles? If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and our nation. In other words, if we let Jesus live, if we let Jesus go out and do his thing, if we allow him and his followers to exist and to multiply, our nation will fall. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest, that same year said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not.
In other words, there will be problems that will be brought to the forefront, and there will be solutions to the problem that will begin to contradict what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists, especially when it comes to the Sabbath. And when those solutions to the problems that are being brought to the forefront start to go against what we believe about the Sabbath and we insist on keeping the law of God, what do you think we're going to end up being? Enemies of the state. We saw in the time of Jesus' day, the left and right political parties across many denominations. It will not just be an ecumenical movement of many denominations coming together, but it will also be not coming just from one side of the political aisle, as many assume and as many have uh, insisted upon, but that it will be a joining of two different sides, a joining of enemies for the persecution of God's people. In Desire of Ages, page 538, it says, So as the priests, the rulers, the elders, gathered for consultation, it was their fixed determination to silence him who did such marvelous works that all men wondered. Pharisees and Sadducees were more nearly united than ever before. Divided here the two, they became one in their opposition to Christ. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees, although both Jews, they were like two different denominations of Judaism. There was the conservative and the liberal side of Judaism. And one believed one thing about the resurrection, about the state of the dead, about the judgment. The others, Sadducees, didn't believe it at all. They didn't believe in a future judgment, a resurrection of the dead. And these groups, enemies, constantly bickering and, and just in bitter strife with each other at all times, now we see them coming together. And they were coming together in one because of their opposition to Christ. We see the same thing, Pilate and Herod. The same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together for before they were at enmity between themselves. Men that you would not have described ever coming together. If you understand who Herod was and who Pilate was, but we've got people that would have never united before now coming together for the purpose in opposition to God's people. Are you ready to stand up to the entire world that is in opposition to you and what you believe in? Do you hold the truths of the Word of God so dear that when the world is saying your beliefs are standing in the way of the solutions that are being presented for the, what they would say is the salvation of mankind, are you ready to stand up to the rest of the world that is going to be in opposition to you? Because the things that we have so enjoyed in this country, the freedoms that we have so enjoyed, the system of government that we have probably taken for granted is not going to be on our side anymore. The beast that had horns like a lamb is going to speak as a dragon. We saw the speaking of a dragon, the speaking of a nation is through its legislative and judicial authorities. Just as it was in the time of Jesus, his earthly trial was unfair and unjust. Now this is a topic in and of itself, the illegal trial of Christ. But just to highlight a small piece of that, in Last Day Events 145, it says, those who live during the last days of earth, this earth's history will know what it means to be persecuted for the truth's sake. In the courts, injustice will prevail. The judges will refuse to listen to the reasons of those who are loyal to the commandments of God because they know the arguments in favor of the fourth commandment are unanswerable. They will say, as it was in the time of Jesus, we have a law, and by our law, he ought to die. God's law is nothing to them. Our law with them is supreme. Those who respect this human law will be favored, but those who will not bow to the idle Sabbath have no favors shown them. The system of government that we have enjoyed, the system of government that has allowed the gospel to go to the entire world will no longer be in your favor. Those freedoms will no longer exist. And not only that, not only will your government, your nation, your home, 
not be a place of safety, but your friends will betray you. Family members, loved ones will leave you. Did Jesus experience the same thing? Couldn't find a better verse to highlight it than this. Mark 14 and verse 50. They all forsook him and fled. Every single one of them. Even Peter, one who promised to fight for Jesus, to stand up to the bitter end. Even he took off running when it got too, too trying. He chopped off a man's ear and then took off running practically. This will be the experience of God's people at the end of time. And I want us to think about this quote right here. There are many in the church who take it for granted that they understand what they believe, but until controversy arises, they do not know their own weakness. When separated from those of like faith and compelled to stand, what's that say? Singly and alone. To explain their belief, they will be surprised to see how confused are their ideas of what they had accepted as truth. And this just highlights what we were talking about in Sabbath school, why it is so important for us to come to church with the desire, with the motivation to know how it is that we can share this truth for, with others. That we can't just come to church wondering how it is we can be fed, how it is that we can hear what we want to hear, how is it that we can be a blessing to other people? And that being the motivation, we go to the resources that we have. We go to the Bible studies. We've got stacks of them out there, glow tracks. We ingest everything that we've been so blessed to have at our fingertips so that we can share it with someone else that needs it. Because there's a world that is dying for lack of food, for a lack of God's light. And if we come to church with the motivation of how it is we can bless someone else, we will be feeding ourselves to feed someone else. The blessing that we may have been looking for may just be in that we wanted to bless others, and now we are blessed because of it. We need to understand what we believe in for ourselves. There's going to come a point in time where we will not be able to grab the Bible study, grab the DVD, grab the link to a, a YouTube video, we need to be able to understand and believe the truth of God's word for ourselves. As it was in Jesus' day, as we are seeing today, political leaders bending to the mob, listening to a mob mentality, and we see this here with Pilate, such a strong leader, a Roman that had pride in, in his work and what, what he was doing, his position, his authority, but even he could not stop the mob. It says, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. He knew Jesus was innocent. He knew what he was doing was wrong, but because of the mob, he said, see you to it. Even though he could wash his hands all day long, but he's guilty of the blood of Jesus. Because he was not willing to stand up to principle. He knew Jesus was innocent. Are you able to stand up to a, uh, a firing squad, to a mob banging on your door? to uh, lanterns and pitchforks. I mean, whatever picture comes to your mind of, of what you may have to endure as you stand up in a trial all by yourself, think of these things. Are you ready to endure what Jesus endured and what he willingly endured for you and me? To leave us an example because Jesus was successful. Jesus overcame and speaking of Pilate here, it says, Satan and his angels were tempting Pilate and trying to lead him on to his own ruin. They suggested to him that if he did not take part in condemning Jesus, others would. The multitude were thirsting for his blood. Now think of that statement when we just read at the beginning of this message that those who unite with the world 
will be partakers of the same spirit. This was a mob that was thirsting for the blood of Jesus. Are there going to be multiple groups at the end of time, or are there going to be two groups? Two groups. It says, if he did not deliver him to be crucified, he would lose his power and worldly honor and would be denounced as a believer on the imposter. Through fear of losing his power and authority, Pilate consented to the death of Jesus. What decisions do we make when we have fear of losing a job? When we have fear of losing influence, power, authority, position, whatever it may be? Do we stand up for principle or do we cave to save our own self? Or do we cave at the request of a mob? Just as it was in the days of Jesus, the church would combine combine the gospel and politics, would give up the gospel mission for the purpose of joining with the state. John 19, 12 and 13, it says, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. And they're saying this right in front of the king of the universe. The whole purpose and mission that the Jews were to have was to prepare the world for the coming Messiah for the coming king that was to be there to rescue and to save the world, to crush the head of the serpent. This was the long-foretold Messiah, and he's standing right there in front of them, and they say, we would rather have Caesar. We would rather have Barabbas. And just as it was in the days of Jesus, the world will be happy to sentence you to death. Your life is not important to Satan and his angels and to those that have allowed themselves to unite with him in worldliness and in partaking of the same spirit. Thirsting for the blood of an innocent man to the point to where all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. When there's only two groups and we only see ourselves, we, we can only find ourselves in one of two groups receiving the seal of God or thirsting for the blood of an innocent person. That's a stark contrast. What side will you find yourself on? What spirit are you partaking of now? Are you uniting with the world in worldliness and preparing yourself to join in this spirit right here? Great Controversy, page 22, says, The great sin of the Jews was their rejection of Christ. The great sin of the Christian world would be their rejection of the law of God, the foundation of his government in heaven and earth. The precepts of Jehovah would be despised and set at naught. Millions in bondage to sin, slaves of Satan doomed to suffer the second death, would refuse to listen to the words of truth in their day of visitation. Terrible blindness, strange infatuation. So if we are willing to set aside the law of God now, what spirit are we partaking of? If the Sabbath is the final issue at the end of time, how do we treat the Sabbath? Do we treat the Sabbath with indifference? Do we treat it as holy as God has commanded it so? Because if we look at the law of God with indifference, then we are partaking of the same spirit of those thirsting for the blood of Jesus. There's only two groups. And if we think of the good news of God's word, the gospel, that God is wanting to take lost, 
sin-sick, suffering humanity and recreate them in the image of God. If you don't believe, just as the Sabbath, God took a normal, average day. That first seventh day was not holy until after God rested on it. God took a regular day and made it holy. God wants to take regular people, you and I, and he wants to make us holy. If we don't believe that God can take humanity and finish the work that he has started in us, give us victory over every single sin in our life, then there is no point in worshiping on the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is a symbol and a sign of what God wants to do with his people. He wants to finish his work that he started in you and me. He wants us to follow the example that Christ gave us. Those who prayed, his blood be on us and on our children, will receive the answer to their prayer. God will always give us what we ask for. The judgment is not God uh, giving you something that you didn't want. The judgment is recognizing what you wanted the entire time. And those asking for the blood of Jesus, the responsibility and the guilt of killing Jesus, God will answer their prayer and he will give them just what they want. Then the whole world will know and understand. They will realize who and what they, poor, feeble, finite beings, have been warring against. In awful agony and horror, they will cry to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? The wrath of God, the seven last plagues poured out without mixture on this world are prepared for those that have joined the spirit of the mob that was thirsting for the blood of Christ. And in that same spirit, there will be those doing the same thing for God's people. They will sentence and put to death anyone that stands in their way. And for those that want to honor the law of God, that want to live the law of God, and that would be willing to die in order to not sin against the God of heaven. Revelation 16, verse 5 through 7, speaking of these seven last plagues, and that third plague mirrors what was taking place in the time of Jesus. It says, The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of water. They became blood. And I heard the angels of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and wast and shalt be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. The third plague is in response to those that have given a death sentence to God's people at the end of time. For those thirsting for the blood of the innocent saints of the Most High that are standing through the final trial at the end of time, the third plague is God's answer to them. You wanted blood, I have now given you blood to drink. And how the tables have now turned, for those that wanted the blood of Jesus to be upon them, the guilt and responsibility of putting the Savior and the Creator of the universe and His death upon them, the tables have turned because we see Jesus in His coming back to this earth, Revelation 19, 11 through 13, it says, I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but he himself, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. We see this because he tread the winepress of those wicked grapes. And his name is called the Word of God. There's only two sides that we can be found on. And as we get closer and closer to the end, we see those two camps, the distinction between, between those two becoming more and more clear. What side are we finding ourselves on? Because what's so interesting about that statement that the Jews made, that they wanted the blood of Jesus to be upon them, that they didn't quite know what they were asking for. Of course, they were 
to receive the, the guilt and the curse of the death of Jesus. But little did they know that what they needed would also be for the blood of Jesus to be upon them. Because we're told, Leviticus 17 and verse 11, it says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Blood represents life. 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19 says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the, what? Precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Jesus, who left us an example, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. His life, his blood, his example was spotless, and he's offering it to you and me. Because all of us stand here guilty before God. All of us stand here ready to receive the curse, but Jesus is saying, I can wash you. Because of my spilled blood, because of the life that I lived, I can cleanse you of your sins. I will redeem you. I will buy you back from the a life of sin and slavery that you have found yourself so intertwined in. Revelation 1 and verse 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Right now, Christ wants to offer his life to you because every single one of us is already guilty of the blood of Jesus. Every single one of us who have sinned, and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, every single one of us is guilty of that blood. And Jesus is saying, I can turn that around. I can give you my blood, and I can wash you from that sin. I can make you guiltless before God. I can cleanse you and have you stand justified just as if you had never sinned. He doesn't want to hold one single thing against you. And he wants to give you victory over every single sin in your life. Romans 4 and verse 7, it says, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Our sins, our life, our blood needs to be covered in the blood of Jesus. In the judgment, we don't want to stand before the Father in our own life. We want the blood of Jesus to be covering the record of our life. We want his life to be in our place. And Jesus is offering that to every single one of us as a free gift. Not one single person here is too far gone, has created too great of a sin that the blood of Jesus is not stronger than, that the blood of Jesus cannot overcome, that the blood of Jesus cannot give you power to overcome and to cleanse and to give you a life of victory. Go with me to Revelation chapter 7. And as we think about the group that is here in Revelation chapter 7, the 144,000, those that will go through the final trial, those that will endure the final test, those that receive the seal of God, this is their experience and can be every single one of ours as well. Revelation 7, beginning in verse 13. It says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto them, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white. In the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. That is our experience. Amen? 
That is the group that every single one of us will find ourselves in. There are only two groups. And it's time, since we are this close to the end, that we start deciding what group we're going to be in. There are only two paths that we can go in, step by step in preparation to receive the seal of God and have this be our experience, or to receive the mark of the beast and to receive of the unmingled wrath of God. The choice is simple, right? And it's easy. God has done the hard work for you. He wants to live his life through you. He has not left you alone. He will never leave you or forsake you. His spirit will always dwell with you. He wants to give you his life. He wants to cover you in his blood, and he wants to make you victorious, and he wants to give you this experience. How many of you want that experience? We don't want to be like the mob, but we want to freely accept the free gift of the blood of Jesus on our behalf, in our place, for the forgiveness and cleansing of our sins to finally give us victory so that we can be standing there with palm branches in our hands, a victorious people because God has given us the victory. Praise be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are eternally grateful for what you have done on our behalf. For the tremendous sacrifice that you made, you put your, your life and your eternal life at risk for our salvation. Father, what a waste it would be if we did not accept that free gift now. I pray, Father, that you would bless every single one of us, that you would cleanse every single one of us, that we would be covered with your blood, that we would accept that free gift of love and mercy that you have come all this way to offer to us. Because right now, before that, Father, we are already guilty of your blood. We are already guilty of nailing you back to that cross and putting you in an open shame. So I pray, Father, that you would forgive and you would cleanse every single one of us, that you would give us the strength, that you would give us the victory, that you would reveal to us whatever it is that is standing in our way of receiving that free gift of salvation that we can experience here on this earth right now. So I pray, Father, that you'd be with every single one of us. May we be found patiently enduring through whatever trial comes our way, and may all of our names remain in that book of life. And we ask and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.